Uh, my name is Mark Devlin. I'm from the University of Pennsylvania and I'm an experimental cosmologist and I've been doing this kind of work for, oh, since about 1990 uh, during my first CMB experiments at the University of California at Berkeley uh, where I did my PhD. Uh, I've been since then building a number of instruments uh, that operate from balloons, uh, from northern Chile, uh, from Sweden, and from uh, even from Virginia, where we are using them to study the, uh, the evolution of the universe by looking at the cosmic microwave background. Uh, I've been involved with the Simons Observatory since inception, uh, and we've been, uh, my group in particular, has been building the, uh, the Large Aperture Telescope, which is a six meter telescope that we're constructing to go in Chile, as well as the receiver that's going to be going into, uh, into that telescope. Cosmic wave background experiments are uh, essentially measuring the temperature of the sky. And uh, in particular for the Large Aperture Telescope, we're looking at uh, a large portion of the sky, you know, 10,000 plus square degrees of the sky. And what limits the sensitivity of these instruments is not building a better detector, but building more detectors. In other words, the detectors are as sensitive as they can, as they can be, but uh, we need more sensitivity on the sky, so we just have to make more detectors. And when I started building detectors uh, you know, 30 years ago, uh, I'd hand-built them uh, under a microscope, and we would build five, and then we would fly them on a balloon. Uh, now, uh, with the current Atacama Cosmology Telescope, we have 3,000 detectors, and we're looking at going to 80,000 or more detectors for the Simons Observatory. Uh, and that is a, is a really big challenge in itself, just by actually building the detectors. But the problem is that the, uh, you have to put the detectors somewhere, which involves putting them onto a focal plane. And the, uh, the ACT focal plane, for example, is, is about three degrees in diameter. It means it covers three degrees of the sky at a time. In order to get more sensitivity, we can't just make it more sensitive there. We actually have to have more square degrees. And so the current telescope that we're designing for the Simons Observatory has a nine degree field of view, which is almost 10 times more collecting area, essentially, uh, or focal plane space that we have, to, we have to occupy. And physically, the way that works is the focal plane gets physically bigger. And so we're now talking about building a camera which has a, uh, a focal plane, which is almost two meters in diameter. And that is, is a big challenge that nobody's ever really done before. Uh, and it all has to be cooled to 0.1 degrees above absolute zero. And when you combine all this together, uh, you're looking at a combination of an engineering challenge, a cryogenic challenge, an optical challenge, and basically an electronics challenge for, for actually reading out all these detectors. So, what we're doing is, in a, you know, a staged way, building a, a cryogenic receiver, which is the size of a small room. It's two and a half meters in diameter and about two and a half meters long, uh, cryogenic receiver. It winds up cooling down about, uh, about one metric ton, or a little over 2,000 pounds of material to four degrees above absolute zero. And then, we have to have another section which is cooled down to one degree above absolute zero, and then ultimately we're cooling about, uh, about 100 kilograms, or about 220 pounds, down to 0.1 degrees above absolute zero. And while we're doing that, it can't be like it's floating around. It has to be mechanically coupled to the telescope and cryogenically insulated from the telescope, which is really hot. So this requires an enormous amount of engineering and, and basically knowledge that uh, our team has been building for the last 30 years and building cameras that have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. But this one's a big step. I mean, it's a factor of 10 step in the, in the size. Uh, so just the challenge of moving this thing is a big deal. I mean, it weighs, it weighs uh, 10,000 pounds and, uh, and you can't just lift it up. You have, to, you have to be really careful about it. So the team has been uh, working hard to you know, tra you know, basically qualify it at the company that made it to make sure that they've done it right and they've, everything's in the right spot, get it all packed up, bring it to the University of Pennsylvania where we open it back up and we started essentially stepwise putting it back together and then what we're going to call qualifying it at certain temperatures to make sure that it actually operates uh, each, time, you know, each time we go to a lower temperature. And the reason we do this is because you know, if you threw it all together at once, then it didn't work at, at the lowest temperature, you really wouldn't know what was going wrong. And so if we actually prove it works at four degrees Kelvin and say it meets all our specifications, 
then we know when we put the next stage in that it's not a problem with the four Kelvin stuff, it's the problem with the 100 millikelvin stuff and we can, we can address that separately. And so it's a, it's a methodical process that, 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 uh, that takes time. And the reason it takes so much time is because you're cooling down you know, a, a, a ton of material from all the way at room temperature all the way to just above absolute zero and uh, you have to remove all that heat. And uh, we use a mechanical helium coolers to do that, but it takes time. <laughs> and so we've been uh, working really hard. But we've had a lot of successes uh, in this in this process. You know, one of them is that we actually put, just as a test, uh, a metric ton of material, extra material, on the four Kelvin plate just to weigh it down, so that it would behave like it would in in reality. And we measured how much it moved under that load and it didn't move at all. It didn't move less than a quarter of a millimeter was the limit of our measurement, uh, which was a really phenomenal achievement for our team because you know it met, it basically followed all the models and met all the specifications just the first time we put it together, which is really, really, uh, it speaks to uh, basically planning and review before you, before you execute and it's been done really well. The, the science from the Large Aperture Telescope involves looking at uh, essentially small scale variations in the cosmic microwave background on small angular scales. And uh, what we're looking for is uh, essentially using the cosmic microwave background as a backdrop to the universe. So if you know how the cosmic microwave background should look, and you, when you look at it, it's different, then the, you can speculate that the reason it's different is because it's interacted with matter along the way between when it was emitted to when we see it now. And there's, there's a couple ways that can happen. Uh, the first way is it can you know, just basically hit something and stop. Uh, but they're really, you know, the amount of s solid objects in space is, is pretty small. And so you don't really see uh, you know, uh, the, the photons just disappear. But what you do see them is, is somehow changed. Uh, and one of the ways they do it is because they're, the evolution of structure in the universe is happening over cosmic time. And uh, you can imagine uh, that if there's a photon emitted from the cosmic microwave background as it, as it traverses the universe, as the universe is evolving, and it passes by uh, large scale objects, like really, you know, things which are hundreds of millions of light years in diameter but have mass to them, there'll be a gravitational lensing effect. It'll actually deflect the photon because of the gravitational potential as it passes by. And what that winds up doing is uh, distorting what we see from the cosmic microwave background. Now, of course, you didn't know what the cosmic microwave background was supposed to be in the beginning, but we do know statistically how it should behave. And one of the key things is that there should be no correlation in the, 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 the photons from patches of sky which are separated by more than, say, a degree or two. And uh, if we do see that correlation, we see that photons are somehow associated with each other uh, from one direction of the sky to another direct direction of the sky, and around a two-degree scale, that correlation was induced by structure in the universe as these photons traversed it. And uh, we can look for that in the maps. It's very subtle. It's uh, you know, very, very small changes, uh, but they speak to the evolution structure of the universe. The other thing that can happen is that they, the photons uh, will interact with a very large object, uh, in particular uh, hot, uh, big clusters of galaxies. These are objects which uh, can be several million light years in diameter and, uh, and have uh, contained upwards of 10,000 galaxies like our own all kind of orbiting and interacting with each other. Uh, part, of course, the, it's mostly empty space, but inside that empty space there is going to be free electrons. And the electrons are very hot and uh, they emit x-rays, but they also will distort the cosmic microwave background in a very specific way. So we can scan over the sky and look for these distortions uh, and locate where these clusters are. So it's a, it's a way of finding them. Those are just two examples of the way we use the cosmic microwave background as a tool to probe the intervening universe. The issue is, of course, that uh, we need to get to a certain sensitivity level to make that happen. And you can imagine uh, each of our detectors is a thermometer, and it's taking the temperature of the sky at Different, different points. And we have you know, 80,000 thermometers and we're looking at the sky in 80,000 different spaces and we scan them across the sky and we're always measuring the temperature. But every time we measure the temperature, it has a noise, it has an error to it. It's not, not the true value, it's the true value plus or minus some number. And if you believe 
that the, the true value is constant, which we hope for the cosmic wave background, then if you make the measurement many, 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 many times, uh, then you can average the noise down in order to get closer to the true value. So our detectors have a certain fixed noise level, which is determined by the environment that they're in. And so we know how much that noise is, and you know the level that you need to achieve in order to, to meet your goals, and you know how much sky you want to coverage. And it's only about three lines or four lines of math to figure out uh, how long you need to be on the sky given a certain number of detectors. And for the Simons Observatory, um, it's a soft goal. In other words, you know, you're learning things all along the way, uh, so you don't have to get to the final one before you know stuff. But to achieve the, our, what we think is the, the, uh, uh, the sensitivity level that, that we've been advertising, it takes about five years. So you're essentially taking the telescope and scanning over uh, the same patches of sky for five years. And you know, it's, it's tens of thousands of square degrees, but it's still going back and doing it, back and doing it, and back and doing it, until you build up the statistical um, uh, power to find out what they, what they actually are. Now, one of the challenges of this is, you know, we, we, we speak a lot about the instrumentation and then the telescope and the detectors and so forth, but really, ultimately, this is going to be a software task uh, because we're going to be, again, taking many, many, many terabytes of data over the course of those five years, and the, the amount of effort that needs to go into uh, not just getting the data in, but uh, taking it from you know, a time stream, you know, here's the readout from a single one of your 30,000 detectors, here's its time stream, here's where it was located when it did it, and taking all of that and then combining it with all the other detectors, uh, dealing with a lot of the uh, idiosyncrasies of the telescope and combining all those things in, that is an enormous effort. And it's going to involve many dozens of people throughout the Simons Observatory to get that all done. And even when that's done, uh, you know, you still have to go and interpret what it means. And that's an, another set of people who come in and say, okay, now that I understand what the map of the sky looks like, well, okay, um, now I have to go extract information from that map and, uh, and understand it. And that takes even more time to do and more software and more talent to, to make that happen. And that's why you see the, a group like the Simons Observatory is so large. You have a whole slew of people who are involved with designing and implementing the instrument, then you have another set of people who are involved with the software pipeline, and another set of people who are preparing for what theoretically we should be seeing and how to interpret what we see and, and how, to, how to react to things that maybe you don't, didn't expect that were there, which is even more exciting. So it's a big project and, uh, and requires a lot of coordination to make this happen.